thank you dr resendez for coming here to university of nebraska lincoln and visiting the department of history we're really excited to have you here as our poly lecturer this evening and god you could take some time to talk to us about your but your bancroft winning book the other slavery i think just to start out i'd like to hear about the readers you're seeking in that work and what it is you want them to take away from your study right well thank you it's a pleasure to be here and um and uh, I, in order to answer your question, I will start out by saying that uh, it, it, it is a book that emerged a little bit as, uh, in an accidental fashion, meaning I originally thought that it would be a more self-contained 16th century kind of a book. And as I was doing the, the groundwork for it, I uh, realized that uh, there was really nothing out there that would give us the larger contours of this story. So I eventually persuaded myself that that would be the, the best service I could provide to the profession and to readers at large was to try to give these larger framework. And I also became convinced that in the, in the very same way that you can't really understand the history of Western Africa without reference to the transatlantic slave trade, you can't really connect these little stories without having a sense of the larger uh, structure uh, looming over the whole of the hemisphere. And so I didn't really write the, the history of the hemisphere. That would be a little too much. But, I, but it is, as you know, a, a fairly sweeping 400-year uh, story that begins in the Caribbean, moves into Mexico and, and into, uh, into the American Southwest. And, uh, and so that's, that's the, my hope is to uh, reach a variety of scholars, some of them obviously interested in issues of bondage, whether African slavery or Indian slavery, but a variety of other scholars who may be interested in gender or in colonialism, in labor relations. Um, uh, so that is my, my hope. Yeah. Well, and I think you're pointing to what for me was one of the most impressive aspects of the book is just the range of sources you use from the Iberian Peninsula to Chile, Caribbean, the U.S.-Mexico borderland. And so maybe you could also speak to uh, junior scholars who are working in these comparative empire studies um, about the nature of the work you had to do in those archives and um, in the, the many overlapping disciplines of the secondary work that you put together for this study. Sure. Um, I mean, um, I am glad that the, that the book is done, but <laughs> it was a, uh, a very challenging, and, sure. and for, for a while I, I doubted whether I would be able to pull it off um, uh, with, uh, with the immensity of the sources. I would say that uh, there are... Um, a couple of advantages. One is, for example, and some of your uh, viewers may, may find this interesting, is that the, uh, the Spanish sources, uh, the Spanish colonial sources, um, uh, in many cases have been digitized. And so there is this enormous effort by the Spanish Ministry of Culture to digitize literally hundreds of thousands of records. Mm. And they have cataloged that. And it, that is available on your computer. Um, and so uh, one of the reasons that tipped the scales in favor of writing this larger book was that I counted on that. So that was right. one, uh, one uh, piece of evidence. So I think the, 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 the greater availability of sources online is something that will enable to take us, you know, more ambitious projects that involve a multitude of archives in scattered in different places. Um, so, so that that's so, so. I would tell that to scholars that don't be shy into pursuing your uh, subjects, even when they cross borders or empires or geographic or you know, present-day geographic uh, um, uh, areas. Great. Yeah. Great. Um, I first read um, Changing National Identities at the Frontier when I was a graduate student. And you've mentioned that you sort of fell into the larger scope of what you initially thought would be a 16th century study. Can you sort of talk about, just as a scholar, the evolution of your work from book to book that, that got you to this point? Sure. 
Um, so interestingly, I uh, started out by identifying a, a gap, what I thought was a gap. And this is, remember, we're going back to the early 2000s when uh, I was really trained as a Latin Americanist, and I saw that the areas that had been absorbed by the United States were not properly served by that literature. And so I started out very simple-mindedly as just uh, there's a gap here and I could do something about it. I looked at the records and I saw that there was a wealth that was not, uh, that had not been mined. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, I started that way. Uh, little did I know that in the course of the subsequent years, borderlands would emerge as a major field. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, um, so, so it has been a, a great uh, joy to see that that field uh, come to fruition. Now, uh, it's it's very difficult to make the same argument that there is a gap because there is such great scholarship being done on 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 that the U.S.-Mexico borderlands and other borderlands as well. I would say, however, that. Um, while uh, those records have been mined, I think what we need to do is to take the next step, which is uh, while we know the dynamics of these borders or we understand them a little better, um, that information has in turn led us to, uh, to, uh, to, the, to the realization that we need to understand better what's happening outside of our of these borders in a country that we may not feel comfortable um, you know working with and so in my latest book for example the the other slavery i was very interested in in new mexico but really the the way to understand the captive dynamics of new mexico was by looking at the mines in chihuahua fully in chihuahua not the borderland but really further south and, and the same thing occurs in other parts of the United States. I mean, if you you can do the Carolinas and you realize that there is this trade with the Caribbean islands, but uh, and you can stop at that, but you can really try to understand better exactly what is happening in specific islands and how that impacts the Carolinas or, uh, or New England. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the step where we are right now, where we are really uh, in need of uh, get, a, get a better sense of these uh, regions outside of the United States and truly understanding, truly going into the records, the primary records of those places and, uh, and seeing how they fit into the narrative of the United States in this case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think your work does an amazing job of really identifying where the border has an influence on the actors and the processes but not stopping at the border sort of transaction mm -hmm. of the slave trade, but thinking more deeply into each of those empires, north and south, um, or even globally speaking, mm -hmm. um, how far those, those traces go mm -hmm. beyond the geopolitical boundary. Mm -hmm. um, in, in sort of a related way, I think you also very creatively read the legal record um, and, and sort of not taking it at face value. Mm -hmm. um, to me, that's related to your expansive view of borders as moving beyond the sort of boundary line itself as well. Mm -hmm. um, so could you talk a little bit about the importance of reading the law in a critical way as you did in the other slavery mm -hmm. to show um, how this market expanded after formal legal abolition? Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah, that was uh, really the greatest conceptual headache I had in, in writing this book, uh, which is even at the very start of the book, I would visit places and give talks about the project that I was involved in and the definitional problem of slavery. What, what exactly do you mean by this slavery uh, always came up mm -hmm. in all of these talks. And at first, I was thinking, well, I could come up with a definition, but that is a, a, a an, and I need to come up with a definition, but I wanted a very broad definition because I thought that a, a very stultifying way to proceed would be to, well, only the people who are being bought and sold or some characteristic like that, and then not look at what's out there. But really what I was looking at was a, which is born from the historical experience of the Spanish Empire, which prohibited Indian slavery, and therefore people found creative ways to get around the law. 
Uh, what I wanted was to capture that phenomenon. And so my definition had to be broad enough to capture that. Uh, I didn't want to take the colonial uh, categorization at face value. Right. Um, and so whenever the you know Spanish lawyers of the 16th century said, well, this is not slavery, this is encomienda, or this is repartimiento, or this is this, or this is that, I didn't want to take that, them at their, at their word. And so... Um, after struggling with this question, really, for much of the, uh, of the research period of the book, uh, it finally uh, began dawning on me that, well, uh, one of the central characteristics of this phenomenon, this broad phenomenon that I was looking at, was that Indians get moved from one place to another. Mm. And there are some good reasons for that, right? Because if you don't move Indians, the acquirers of those Indians open themselves to retribution from other members of that group. So, so, so the, force, the, the forcible transportation of Indians from one place to another was a very central uh, aspect of this, regardless of the details of exactly how they had wound up in that place. The, um, the uh, inability to leave the workplace was another central element, of course. So I eventually boiled down to four. So forcible mobility, inability to leave the workplace, uh, threat of violence or violence to to get compliance from the victims of this phenomenon, and uh, finally um, a very symbolic or no payment. Mm -hmm. And so again, I found many instances in which these individuals were paid, but it was they were paid such an absurdly low sum that it made no sense to call that a payment. Mm -hmm. um, so those were the the broad parameters that I ended up with, because I do believe that uh, it is a legitimate point to raise that th there has to be some way of, uh, of, um, of defining these other slavery, as I call it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, other people will, uh, other scholars will define it in different ways. But that is, that is the, certainly a, a major uh, problem that I struggled all along. Yeah. And I think that's... Um something that other scholars in the field of both borderland studies and Western history have encountered a lot. Um, and you can see that sort of at play within the field in terms of uh, distinctions between borderlands and frontier mm -hmm. terminology and mm -hmm. the weight that each of those concepts carry. Mm -hmm. um, and then also trending today concerns about characterizing North American colonization as genocide. Mm -hmm. um, and so given your expertise in um, you know, four centuries of this process. Would you want to weigh in on sort of how you see those concepts evolving and and that debate moving forward? Yeah, I mean, as I uh, as I uh, was saying in a previous answer, um, I think that we really need to step beyond the borders themselves and go into these outside regions. So that is the great lesson that I found in the latest book uh, that I wrote. Um, and um, so, so I think that's that's what I would uh, encourage uh, scholars to look at as they uh, to, to become bolder to go into because of the accessibility of the records, because of the uh, um, of the way our world operates now. Um, I think this is a, a very good uh, a good development that I think we need to still um, work on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should also say um, about the uh, the the legal aspect of this uh, that I found fascinating, which is that um, the legality uh, or the, the legal um, framing of slavery um, is something that you could easily uh, conceive of as, it's very simple to put rules by the Spanish crown or by the Mexican government or the US government. Um, and it's far more difficult to enforce them. So one of the things about slavery is that, Indian slavery, is that uh, you discover the real limitations of enforcement of the Spanish Empire that you conceive of as this you know, absolute monarchy and in reality, on the ground, it was very difficult. If the crown said, no, we, you need to liberate all of these Indians, well, on the ground it didn't happen. Right. Um, by the same token, I don't want to say that, that the law did not matter because uh, the prohibition of slavery uh, did a host of, created a host of problems on the ground as well. As you would imagine, 
because everybody or most everybody who of, of, uh, of means engaged in this activity to some extent, it became a liability politically. So some political opponents, of, uh, uh, you know, accused others of illegal Indian slavery, and that was very common. That's one very good way in which I found my information about uh, about Indian slaves. So. So while it was extremely difficult to enforce, the existence of the law itself um, had, uh, had profound implications about how this society worked. And let alone, of course, uh, the fact that the, rem the remarkable fact that many of these slaves actually took the law and took their masters to court and sued for their freedom, which, uh, which again uh, shows you that even though it may have been difficult to enforce, uh, some people took the law and used it to their advantage. I think that's a, a great point you're making, and it is clear in the book itself that um, although the law may not have been um, equally apportioned or equally implemented, it did offer these sort of flashpoints of opportunity for people to lodge protest or resistance um, that then scholars now can measure in really mm -hmm. clear ways. and. Um, I think that's true in the Spanish, Mexican, and American systems mm -hmm. uh, regarding Indian and black enslavement. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I appreciated about the work is that it's a pretty creative and critical reading of legal sources, um, both as a um, record of the imposition of force and authority, but also um, as a conversation um, about resisting that authority as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I just was really impressed with um, the, the broad scope of the work, but at no point did it really feel like you had lost the humanity of the actors involved. Um, and so over the course of four centuries, that's not an easy task, so I applaud you on that. Thanks so um, much. Maybe just as a way of um, sharing with audiences or readers who aren't as historically minded, um, could you talk a little bit about the parallels you make at the end of the book um, to modern day trafficking? Sure. So um, in the book I call it the other slavery, uh, but in some ways is, uh, it is the most common type of slavery. Um, I, uh, uh, today slavery is forbidden all over the world in the same way that Indian slavery had been forbidden as early as the 16th century, yet it flourishes because it takes advantage of these subterfuges and euphemisms that we were talking about. Um, it, uh, so, uh, so, so unfortunately, the, the, the conclusion of my book is fairly lapidary, which is that uh, these other slavery uh, was never abolished in the way that the other slavery was. Uh, in many ways, it, uh, it, it has proved to be extraordinarily adept at, ch at uh, adapting to different conditions, at surviving. And today, according to the Walk Free Foundation, there are 45, more than 45 million people subjected to modern day enslavement, uh, forms of enslavement that in many cases, Native Americans 200 years ago would find very familiar. So they are enslaved on the basis of debts, of uh, the, legal si the, the legal, si the penal system. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so this is a, a story that has relevance until today. If we want to really seek the origins of that particular modern day form of enslavement. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk to us about your book. And I look forward to the lecture this evening. It's been a real treat having you here on campus. Thank you so much. The pleasure has been mine for having me. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.